Hello and welcome to Network Steganography. Um, my name is Steffen Wenzel. I'm a private docent uh, or lecturer at the Faculty of Mathematics and Computer Science in Hagen. I'm also a professor of Computer Networks and Information Security at Worms University of Applied Sciences and uh, there I'm also the Scientific Director of the Center for Technology and Transfer, which is um, our local research facility in Worms. Um, uh, previously I was head of a smart building security research team at Fraunhofer FKE in Bonn and an associate researcher at uh, German New Zealand um, Research Corporation. I received my habilitation um, in 2020 in computer science and my PhD in 2013, both from the University of Hagen. Previously, I received my master's and um, yeah, FH diploma uh, in German uh, degrees from uh, Kempten and Augsburg University of Applied Sciences. My research interests are network information hiding in covert channels, which is um, the, my, my primary research domain, um, but I also work in the IoT and smart home and smart building security domain, um, wrote some Linux books and also uh, am interested in methodology of information security and uh, scientometrics, which is the, and especially uh, the, the, um, uh, the analysis of citation behavior in uh, information security. Here's a short outline of the uh, course. Um, so the first three chap chapters have uh, an overlap with uh, class uh, 01730, Introduction to Information Hiding, that is taught by Professor Keller. Um, so first we will have a short introduction to steganography and covert channels, um, just the basic terminology, some historical roots. Um, then I will speak a bit more about local covert channels, which is also a short chapter, and then I will explain generic countermeasures that are not specific for the network context, but can be applied, uh, for instance, um, at different um, um, stages of the software development life cycle or directly at the source code level. And then after these first three introductory chapters, I will uh, introduce the fundamentals of network information hiding techniques. Um, chapter five is then about hiding patterns. There are two taxonomies that describe how um, network steganography works and I will cover them. Also some additional details about hiding patterns and then I will speak about how we can hide data in a more sophisticated manner uh, where we for instance apply multiple patterns at the same time or perform distributed uh, information hiding in the network and um, also I will explain adaptive approaches that adjust their hiding behavior to the surrounding environment. In chapter 7 I will discuss selected network level countermeasures. So in comparison to chapter 3 the countermeasures are not tailored for um, local covert channels but they could be, some of them could be um, modified in a way I suppose that they would also work on the um, source code or local operating system IPC level. Then in chapter 8 I will, this is also a short chapter, I will speak about experimental replication studies and then chapter 9, so you already know a lot about cover channels and let's assume you found a new hiding method. Um, so how would a research paper describe such a new hiding method, a new pattern for instance? And finally, in chapter 10, I will explain how steganography in cyber-physical systems and the IoT works. Chapter 11 is uh, conclusion. All right, so let's start um, with an introduction. And I will first cover the very basics of information hiding. 
So um, there is a book recommendation. This book is not necessary. It's not required for this class. It's optional. But it's just to explain that lots of the content, including figures and text that I show during this class, is uh, based on this book, Information Hiding and Communication Networks, published in 2016. Um, of course, this class um, received several updates since then, um, and I just extended it this summer again um, to cover more up-to-date content of recent research um, projects. However, if you are an IEEE member and have access to IEEE Explore, you should be able to freely download the PDF files of um, the book chapters. Also, why this book? Well, um, as you will learn in this class, it, this is a book that um, um, also served as a kind of agreement um, because the scientific community um, that deals with network steganography has some subdomains and people working in the subdomains and the different subdomains ha first had to agree on some common understanding, some common terminology and taxonomy and that was done in this book. Uh, so I will refer a lot to the taxonomy and terms in this book. Um, some chapters of the book are however out of the scope of this class, namely the chapter on traffic obfuscation and the chapter on nef network flow watermarking. So what is information hiding? Um, I will keep the introduction brief because the introductory course is covered um, by Professor Keller, but um, so that we know that we are what we are speaking about. Um, here you can see two different examples of information hiding. Both uh, figures are taken from uh, Wikipedia. So on the left side, the figure on the left side, um, which contains two subfigures, uh, you first see a figure here with a tree and the image of the cat. You see it's a low resolution image. Um, that's because it's hidden in the image of the tree. So there is not so much capacity where you can hide lots of data in it, but this is one form of steganography, image steganography or digital image steganography, where one image is hidden in another image or in general some information, could also be a text or uh, an audio file or something, is hidden in an image. Um, another example of information hiding is watermarking. Here we see an analog example of the 20 euro node and where you can see the watermark. Um, and watermarking is also a subdomain of information hiding. In the classical taxonomy by Petit Collas et al. from 1999, um, information hiding was split into four subdomains, namely covert channels, steganography, anonymity and copyright marking, where watermarking is a subdomain of copyright marking. And anonymity research is about hiding um, the um, 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 subject's identity in communications. However, both uh, aspects are not part of this class. Um, we focus on the first two uh, subdomains, cover channels and steganography, and actually we combine them in our context. So um, steganography and cover channels were originally split from each other, but um, um, the research community already years ago agreed on, um, on uh, a strong link between both terms. But I will um, discuss this link, uh, this link later. So first, um, where did information hiding, especially steganography, appear? Well, one early example is known from ancient Greece. It's now, um, it, it today is in Turkey. Uh, so uh, in 499 BC, um, the ruler of Miletus um, which is, as you can see here, it's close to the coastal 
a border of Turkey. Um, and so that the ruler of this city tattooed a message on the head of one of his slaves to send a message to Aristagoras, which is his son, uh, was his son-in-law, to instruct him to revolt against the Persians. And um, so the idea was that if you send some message directly to uh, the recipient, in that case Aristagoras, then the message would potentially be discovered and um, then uh, this would mean a strategic disadvantage again in terms of this revolt. So um, how can you hide the message on its way to the destination? Well, um, in the case of um, uh, um, that we discuss here, the um, uh, message would be covered by regrown hair on the head of the slave, so it would not be visible. And also the carrier, in that sense the slave, would not even know what kind of message would be uh, written on his um, head, because he cannot look on his head, ob obviously. Well, he could ask someone else to read the message while the hair regrows, of course. So this is an early form of information hiding. Um, another known example that I found in the book of Jessica Friedrich, um, it's a very famous book on digital media steganography, was from the 1978 World Championship in Chess. And the two competitors, uh, Korchnoi and uh, Karpov, um, were uh, competing and um, so they had their chess match and however um, Karpov um, was handed over um, a, a yogurt for consumption during the game and officials were um, curious whether this um, yogurt would contain or represent a secret message. And for this reason, uh, they limited Karpov to consumption of only one type of yogurt, was uh, some violet one, at a fixed, fixed time during the game, so that also not the timing was um, um, giving any secret hints. Also, um, of course, this was not a perfect, um, perfect, uh, prevention of any steganographic message. Instead, one could, of course, uh, rotate the yogurt or shift its position a little bit to the side or whatever to to um, uh, to um, send a secret message to Karpov. However, it was at least a, a known form of steganography limitation, or no, potential steganography limitation, because it was not clear whether steganography was actually involved. Here's another example. It's, um, it's microdots. They were used in Second World War, and uh, for instance, by German spies in Mexico, and uh, the idea is to shrink the image, uh, the, a, a text, uh, a text note to the size of a dot, and this dot is then uh, placed on a paper that can be carried and uh, would look like a dot, but not like a secret message. Um, another thing is um, uh, watermarking, as mentioned, and. Uh, some printers um, print um, dots on uh, on the paper that they print. Uh, they are not visible to the bare eye, but um, with some tricks you can make them visible. On the right side you see these um, yellow dots and um, uh, where printers can add some information, for instance, about, uh, I suppose, the manufacturer or the model or something like that. Um, so this works as well um, and can be even unknown to the users in that case, at least in the sense that they are not aware probably it's written in some um, user license agreement or something. Um, and another example, just to use, so that you see the diversity of information hiding, is font code. 
font code. I linked the video here, uh, but you do not need to watch it. I explain it anyway here. So if the link one day is broken, um, the idea is as follows. So with font code, you shape uh, the letters of a text slightly in a way that the modified shape, uh, which is again not visible to the human eye, uh, unless extremely zoomed and um, known in advance where you have to look at, uh, contains the secret message. So the point here is it works uh, independent of the medium. So if you print the text on paper or if you have it on the screen, doesn't matter because you see um, or the, um, you can still make a photo of the text and then a software can analyze the text and the shapes of the letters and then the secret message can be um, extracted. Yeah, so um, there are many different ways for information hiding. Uh, in the following I will exclude all watermarking. Uh, here is some historical overview and as you see we had covered the human skin where the message was tattooed on the slave's uh, head. This was taking place in ancient Greece. Uh, during the uh, centuries um, several um, approaches arose. I won't go through all of them um, but um, and I'm, I also suppose you know a few of them already. Some are very popular um, and others will be explained during the class. So um, I think very popular is um, uh, linguistic syntax and semantics, so-called linguistic or text steganography, where, uh, for instance, a message in a newspaper, which was used in the Romanticism, uh, covered a secret message. Um, but also where you write some text and, for instance, the first letter always uh, is has to be interpreted of every word to uh, to uh, compile the secret message or uh, commas or, or spacing um, between words can be interpreted and also musical notes um, and however the most interesting part at least for this class is the 20th century where data was hidden in cryptographic protocols and printouts in um, in digital text, in digital media in general, um, can be audio, video files, but and also any other um, media file um, and our source code in operating system file systems, for instance, and in unused uh, uh, areas of allocated um, blocks and also in the metadata of files. Um, you can use network protocols, for instance, redundant information in networks or unused protocol fields. And you can also um, modulate network protocol behavior and so on. And a recent aspect is that data is also hidden in, um, in uh, the IoT. So this is, um, however, 21st century actually. In comparison to um, ancient methods um, where one uh, carrier, um, for instance a human, had to bring every message separately to the secret recipient of the message, uh, modern network information hiding methods allow a constant and low delay sending on kind of on demand while even the response is also extremely quick uh, or can be extremely quick. Um, and also um, when you for instance carry um, 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 a node of text then the capacity is limited to the size of this node while in the network context you can send new network packets every few um, uh, fractions of a second if you want. So it's much easier to to generate new carriers that can be transferred to the secret resender of the data. There are two main 
um, uses of steganography. Um, first, data storage and also this is used for other forms of information hiding like watermarking so you store some data there and secondly covered communication but when covering only steganography like in this class then we can say okay so first of all digital media steganography can be used to store some secret data but other forms of steganography can be used for this purpose too like file or file system uh, steganography if we want to transfer data then we can use local uh, sorry uh, network steganography or covert channels but we can also use other forms of some out of band channels and local covert channels and within operating systems um, out of band covert channels uh, or for instance um, channels over light or um, inaudible acoustic signals so-called uh, covered acoustic channels or um, covered physical channels which are also not in the scope of this class but uh, d these can be used as well. Um, when we compare digital media and network steganography there are some certain differences that uh, can be highlighted. I don't want to go through all of them but I want to um, emphasize the most important ones. So the methods uh, capacity and bandwidth in digital media steganography is obviously limited by the type of the media object and the size of that particular file while in the network it's limited by the type of the traffic and the length of the transmission that of course can be extended on demand um, of course also image files can be created on demand but you need to transfer them if you want to use them as a transfer carrier However, as mentioned, the main purpose is storage. Um, the hidden data embedding process cannot exceed the file capacity in case of the digital media steganography. Um, in network context, it's usually slower, but um, can be continuous over a long period of time. The nature of the digital media information hiding approaches is usually permanent, it's for storage, while it's ephemeral for the network traffic. Um, a forensic analyst, in case of the digital media steganography, can, be, um, can find clues that are available for some forensic experts after the transmission, but they are often not available in case of the network traffic unless uh, you record the network traffic while it's sent. Um, another aspect that I want to highlight, because I will speak about detectability and cost separately, is robustness. So the secret data resistance to modifications. And in digital media steganography, it's typically the case that it cannot survive conversion to other formats unless especially prepared for that. Um, so if you take an mp3 file and convert it to some other um, audio codec um, that is compressed and usually the stego data especially if it's not sophisticated one is destroyed or at least um, the quality is heavily degraded and in the case of network traffic um, the traffic or the stego message is typically vulnerable uh, vulnerable to dynamic changing network conditions for instance uh, changing throughput of a network environment. So the basic model for information hiding, especially steganography, is uh, borrowed from uh, biology and um, usually in the, um, uh, in the in nature you have some prey-predator um, uh, relationship so where some um, 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 uh, animals try to mimic the behavior and appearance of a model so for instance the model could be a branch of a tree and th this model has some characteristics that are indicated here with this star and there's some recipient of the message for instance um, a hunter 
so the enemy of the, the, the um, animal that tries to mimic the model. So let's assume we have some, um, some insect that tries to mimic the branch of the tree. So it does that, it, it shows essentially the same appearance to the recipient of um, the visual uh, or also audible uh, appearance in some cases. And um, however, it has some plus here, it has some additional information. And the recipient uh, has the goal to distinguish between the original branch of the tree and the insect it wants to hunt. Uh, so therefore it needs to determine this plus, so the difference between the appearance of both. And this is the same uh, in case of steganography. So a steganographic message always uh, um, ne needs to appear as closely to an innocent message, an innocent image for instance, but it has some plus and um, the so-called stake analyst would try to detect that plus. Of course we will learn about the details of that uh, in the coming chapters. So what we need now is some fundamental terminology. We need to understand how um, uh, information hiding, uh, uh, research um, uh, communicates and therefore um, we need to understand the terms that the scientific community applies. First of all, and this is a very central term, um, we need to understand the concept of a covert channel. There will be separate chapters dealing with covert channels. It's a, it's a core component of this class, but originally they were defined by Butler Lamson as a non-intended uh, channels uh, so they were not intended for information transfer and that means there are, these are communication channels that should actually not be there they were just not foreseen in a system design and um, but they are there and sometimes they can be used to break a security policy um, when the covert channel has no intention for sending for instance if it leaks data from a cryptographic algorithm we call it a side channel so there's no intentional sender but an example would be that if we can if we have a bad cryptographic uh, algorithm implementation and the algorithm takes more time if there are more one bits in the cryptographic key and the algorithm terminates quicker if there are uh, more zeros than ones in the cryptographic key then we could observe the runtime of the algorithm and that would be an um, information channel that is not foreseen, it would be an unintentional sending of information and this is what we call a side channel. So in 1985 the Department of Defense, the DOD uh, in the US, um, um, defined a cover channel in a way that they said okay we take the definition of Lamson, so the channel is not intended for information transfer and it should not exist. But if it's also breaking a security policy, usually a multi-level security policy, um, then it's a covert channel. And um, back then they defined the covert channel usually in the military context where such multi-level security systems uh, can be fined. So where, for instance, um, a top secret process should not leak data to a secret level process. I will come back to this aspect in a few s few moments. Steganography, however, can be informally defined as the practice of undetectably communicating a message that we also call steganogram within a covert object. And this leads me to the explanation of P Simmons' prisoner's problem from 1983. So in the prisoner's problem, Alice and Bob are located in confined cells and they want to exchange messages with each other but they cannot exchange messages directly. In fact, uh, they can only exchange messages over the warden which we call Walter. So Walter is a prison warden and Walter can take a message from Alice and bring it to Bob. But of course Walter can read the message. Now Alice and Bob want to coordinate their break 
out attempts. They want to escape prison, and but they want to coordinate their activities and jointly escape. And um, what they do is they they take the, the 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 cover object, which is the letter they hand over to Walter, and add some secret information using, for instance, linguistic steganography into the message, so that Walter does not um, uh, understand what's going on. Walter only recognizes the innocent message. However, there are different types of wardens, or Walters in that case, that I will show on the next slide. Some more fundamental terms that we need um, are um, um, coming from an early terminology paper from Fitzman, was a write-up of some agreements, uh, the first information hiding workshop from 1996. Um, so we call the process of embedding uh, a secret message that can be an embedded image, for instance, into a cover data type, which could be a cover image, for instance. So the, 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 pr um, uh, the um, placement of the secret message in that cover object is the embedding process. And the Stego key tells us how it's done, where it's located, how it uh, can again be extracted. So where do we need to look for? Um, the, com the modified cover object with the embedded secret information is called the Stego object. And by knowing the Stego key, so that means we need to know where we look for, we can extract, so the process is called extracting, the uh, steganographic embedded data type again. I said previously that there are different types of wardens and the wardens perform so-called stick analysis and are sometimes also called stick analysts. That means they want to determine whether there is some steganographic communication and what's going on exactly, what's the content and so on. A warden can be passive. That means that it tries to detect the presence and the content of a hidden message in a cover object and also tries to determine who's involved in the steganographic communication. So is Alice communicating with Bob or is there also a third party that they maybe communicate with? Is there steganography actually going on between them and what is the secret message? If it's an active warden, then it also modifies the cover object so that it removes or replaces the steganogram. Um, and Walter, for instance, could um, um, try to modify the messages so that it could he could read the message and then replace the original message with another one that is a copy but without for instance um, the original spacing and uh, grammar mistakes and so on and maybe it just contains the same meaning but different wording and then he would disturb the original message a malicious warden however would be even um, more involved into the, the steganographic process uh, because it can introduce own messages to fool involved participants. So Walter could say, hey Bob, I have a message from Alice, despite the fact that Alice never sent that message, but uh, he could be, uh, he, he could uh, um, try to appear um, as a sender of um, or, or um, a router, so to say, in a network context of a message that was never sent from another participant, and so can try to get involved in the communication. And um, this is the most sophisticated form. It's, it's it, there are few examples um, available, and um, it's uh, difficult to achieve that because it assumes that Walter knows exactly how the secret communication works, so he has knowledge about the stego key and the carrier used and embedding one extraction process. I also want to finalize my statement on the covert channels and the multi-level security context. So in classical papers, a covert channel either violates a so-called no read up or no write down policy um, in the so-called Bell de Padula model. And um, if you are not aware of this fundamental um, security policy model, um, then um, I expect you to, to read about it. It's not very complicated and I also don't go much into detail. So the only thing you need to understand here is 
how it essentially uh, can be used to represent the covert channel. So in, in the Bella Padula model, you have different security levels. I have three example levels here, top secret, secret, and confidential. And um, so it is allowed that some secret level process in some operating system reads data from a secret level process because it's a lower level and it can has access to the secret level. Actually, it's a little bit more complicated. So you have so-called security compartments where um, you can attach um, additional information to the to the subject. So one could be one subject could have a top secret level clearance, but for instance, for some research project, but not for some other research project or some administrative information and so it would not be able to read all secret level information. So this is an, an eased uh, visualization here. And of course a low level would in essentially be allowed to send information up to a higher level, provide information to the higher levels. Uh, what is not allowed is that this top secret level process would uh, and, uh, and the associated subject would be allowed to send some secret data to a lower level that would be a violation of the security policy and at the same time a lower level like here the confidential level process would not be allowed to read secret information because it just does not have access to that so um, this sending would be a write down this is why we have a no write down policy and this reading from higher level information would be a read up this is why we have the no read up policy and both the read up and the write down would represent a covert channel um, in the sense that there is some policy breaking channel that is actually not foreseen in the system design but some somehow, somehow exists for instance um, a classical channel would uh, exploit the position of a disk arm of a, of a um, traditional hard drive and the position of the disk arm could then be controlled, for instance, by a top secret process and could be inferred by a secret level process. And using the disk arm position, they could then uh, exchange the secret information. This is just one example. There are many more. And I will show you local COVID channels, a few selected ones in the next chapter. Now, um, is steganography applied in practice? Well, there are several cases known that, uh, and since the in, in digital media since the uh, early 2000s. Um, some of these channels are um, or uh, uh, uses were uh, never fully clear where it's suspected that they use steganography. In other cases, it, it was clear. Um, I won't go through all of them. It's just a few examples. One very interesting one is that the Linux Foketor malware that hides data and SSH connection was made public or became public in 2013. Since 2014, we have a heavily increase in so-called Stego malware that uses uh, steganography, either in the network or digital media steganography, to transfer secret information. And uh, to this end, we have founded the Queuing Initiative. Queuing stands for Criminal Use of Information Hiding, and it's a Europol EC3 supported. Um, EC3 is the European uh, Cybercrime Center of Europol. Uh, so it's an EC3 supported um, initiative that monitors what's going on in the Stego, uh, mal especially Stego malware domain, but also does some other things. I have a look at the website. Uh, there are some lots of things described or in our article information hiding challenges for forensic experts that is available via the ICM digital library. Um, here are some examples of steganography malware uh, from one of our papers and for all of these malware cases you can see which uh, methods they apply and the purpose so i won't go through all of them you can do if you want uh, but i summarized things here so um, they the, the the use cases are essentially that they perform some stealthy command and control communication for botnets or some covered data exfiltration or they use steganography to hide confidential data. And of course, um, let me go back here, they use uh, highly heterogeneous um, methods like data hiding in 
heavy icons or JPEG files or bitmap or PNG files or an HTML or in text, uh, in Microsoft Messenger, uh, in um, um, traffic that appears by mimicking Messenger or Yahoo Messenger or HTTP traffic, cloud services, Netflix app, error messages and HTTP and so on. So it's, it's, it's extremely diverse because the network and digital media provide so many um, uh, places, uh, so many options where you can hide information. So there are different potential scenarios and also potential users. Um, some of course are um, illegal, like uh, using steganography uh, during advanced persistence threats. Uh, when such attacks appear, um, one could, for instance, uh, use uh, some sophisticated data leakage to uh, via covert channels and over the network that exfiltrate uh, sensitive data uh, over longer periods of time out of some organization. And then, of course, malware I discussed. Then uh, I cannot say much about military and secret service because I don't know uh, what they are doing uh, essentially. Uh, so, but they could use it for industry and esp espionage and stealthy communication, obviously. Um, but also, obviously, they want to talk about it. Um, and um, citizens can use steganography for censorship circumvention, so to support the free expression uh, of opinions during internet censorship, for instance, and the same for journalists. Again, as mentioned, the two primary cases are covered data st uh, use cases are data storage and covered communication. Uh, data exfiltration is one if you want a subform of covert communication, uh, and so is stealthy malware command and control. All right, so this is the first introductory chapter. Um, thank you for your attention.